Hello and welcome to this continuing first look exploring session looking at the Dutch Courtesan by John Marston. Uh, we've already uh, covered the first uh, act in a bit, uh, most, or most of the first two acts uh, in the previous session. I say we, I wasn't actually here. Uh, I, I, I have uh, stepped back into the room to uh, to re rejoin uh, this 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 joyous exploration to find out uh, what's going to happen with all these characters with the a plot and the b plot uh, where are they going what are they doing what is their purpose in life uh, to continue that exciting journey from act two scene three onwards uh, reading freeval today is <coughs> laughing but i'm still still muted <laughs> Uh, uh, Rachel, actor on the East Coast. Uh, reading Mistress Smullygrub and Malhuru is... Hello, I'm Valentina. I am an Italian actor in London. Uh, reading Cockle de Moy is... Hello, I'm Helen Good. I'm a historian of the Elizabethan Star Chamber. Uh, and I'm back in Hull. <laughs> <laughs> uh, reading Holyphone is uh, Ty's View and Servant is Hello, I'm Lynn Freitas I am a teacher during the academic year and I am currently coming to you from California, USA I would say sunny California but the sun's not up yet mm. <laughs> Reading uh, Crispinella and Sir Lionel is Hi, I'm Merrick I'm your correspondent from Beyond the Void uh, reading Mully Grub and uh, Kakatur is... Hi, I'm Lois and uh, I'm in for once sunny London. Yes, uh, reading uh, Beatrice good. and Burnish is... Hi, my name is Elizabeth Amisu and I'm an author based in sunny Romford. Uh, reading Nurse and Sir Hubert is... Hi, Alan Scott, still marooned in Suffolk. And I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I'll be reading stage directions and generally pushing us forward to uh, an end point to close the session. Uh, so uh, we've uh, we've last time uh, left off with the A-plot, uh, as we might call it, uh, regarding uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the moment of Malharug uh, making a decision as to what to be doing about the person who, in theory, he, 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 he is in love with and uh, his best mate. Um, and we return to what we might call the B-plot uh, with the uh, continuing um, and, uh, and battle of wits. Shall we call it that? I don't know if that's the right term. Between uh, Cockle de Moy and Mullygrub. And uh, we're going to see where elements that were set up last time uh, go. So act two, scene three, enter Master Mullygrub and Mistress Mullygrub. I don't know if we met her last time, did we? I don't think we did. No. Um, and uh, she with a bag of money. It is right, I assure you, just 15 pounds. Well, Cockle de Moy, tis thou puts me to this charge. By then I catch thee, I'll charge thee with as many irons. Well, is the barber come? I'll be trimmed and then to Cheapside to buy a fair piece of plate to furnish the loss. Is the barber come? Truth, husband, surely heaven is not pleased with our vocation. We do wink at the sins of our people. Our wines are Protestants, and I speak it to my grief, and to the burthen of my conscience, we fry our fish with salt butter. Oh, look to your business, mend the matter, and score false with a vengeance. And exit Mistress Mullygrub at this point. Enter Cockle de Moy like a baba. Ah, welcome, friend. Who's man? A widow Rainskier's man, and shall please your good worship, my name's Andrew Shark. Oh, how does my godson, good Andrew? Very well, he's gone to trim Master Quickwid, our parson. Hold up your head. Uh, how long have you been a barber, Andrew? Oh, not long, sir, this two year. Ah. And a good workman already? I dare scarce trust my head to thee. Oh, fear not. We are pulled better men than you. We learn the trade very quickly. Will your good worship be shaven or cut? Uh, as you will. 
Uh, what trade didst live by before thou turnedst barber, Andrew? I was a peddler in Germany, but my countrymen thrive better by this trade. Um, what's the news, barber? Thou art sometimes at court. Sometimes, Paul a page or so, sir. And what's the news? How do all my good lords and all my good ladies and all the rest of my acquaintance? What an arrogant knave's this, all acquaintancy. Tis cash. Say, sir? Uh, and what news? What news, good Andrew? Marry, sir. You know the conduit at Greenwich and the underholds that spouts up water? Very well. I was washed there one day, and so was my wife. You, you might have wrung her smock, if faith. Uh, but uh, what are those holes? Thus, sir, uh, out of those little holes in the middle of the night crawled out twenty-four huge, horrible, monstrous, fearful, devouring. Bless us serpents which no sooner were beheld but they turned to mastiffs which howled those mastiffs instantly turned to cocks which crowed those cocks in a moment were changed to bears which roared which bears are at this hour to be seen yet in paris garden living upon nothing but toasted cheese and green onions <laughs> By the Lord, and this may be. My wife and I will go see them. This portends something. Yes, worshipful fist, thou'lst feel what portends by and by. And uh, what more news? You shave the world, especially you barber surgeons. You know the ground of many things. Your cunning privy searchers by the mass, you scour all. What more news? They say, sir, that 25 couple of Spanish genets are to be seen hand in hand, dance the old measures, while six goodly Flanders mares play to them on a noise of flutes. Monstrous, this is a lie on my word. <laughs> Nay, and this be not a lie. <laughs> I'm no fool, I warrant. Nay, make an ass of me once. Shut your eyes, close. Wink. Sure, sir. This ball will make you smart. I do wink. Your head will take cold. And, uh... And Cockle de Moy puts on a coxcomb on Molly Grubb's head. Thank you. I'll put on your worship's nightcap whilst I shave you. So, man, hang toasts. Far. Fire, sparrows must peck and cockle de moy munch. <laughs> Twenty-five couple of Spanish jennets to dance the old measures. <laughs> Andrew makes my worship laugh, if faith. Just take me for an ass, Andrew. <laughs> um, <clears throat> dost know one cockle de moy in town? He made me an ass last night, but I'll ask him. Art thou free, Andrew? Um, Shave me well, I shall be one of the common council shortly. And then, Andrew, why, Andrew, Andrew, dost leave me in the suds? And uh, there's uh, indication here of some singing. That's very odd, isn't it? Mm. Uh, why, Andrew, I shall be blind with winking. Ah, Andrew, wife, Andrew, what means this? Wife! My money! Wife! Enter Mistress Mullygrub. What's the noise with you? What ail you? Where's the barber? Gone. I saw him depart long since. Why? <laughs> are you not trimmed? Trimmed? Oh, wife, I am shaved. Did you take hence the money? I touch you not, as I am religious. Oh, Lord, I have winked fair. And enter Holly Pernis. I pray you, Godfather, give me your blessing. Oh, Holofernes. Oh, where's thy mother's Andrew? Blessing, Godfather. Ah, the devil choke thee. Uh, where's Andrew, thy mother's man? My mother hath none such, forsooth. 
Oh, my money, 15 pounds, plague of all Andrews. Who was it trimmed me? I know not, Godfather. Only one met me as I was coming to you and borrowed my furniture, as he said, for a jest's sake. What kind of fellow? A thick, elderly, stubbeard fellow. Cockle de moy, cockle de moy. Raise all the wise men in the street. I'll hang him with mine own hands. Oh, wife, some rosa solis. Good husband, take comfort in the Lord. I'll play the devil, but I'll have recover it. Have a good conscience. Tis but a week's cutting in the term. Oh, wife, oh, wife. Oh, Jack, how does thy mother? Is there any fiddlers in the house? Yes, Master Click's noise. Bid them play, laugh, make merry, cast up my accounts, or I'll go hang myself presently. I will not curse, but a pox on cockle de moy, he has polled and shaved me, he has trimmed me. And exit. Uh, so, yes, so uh, at some point during that, just before that random bit of song business, uh, obviously, uh, uh, cockle de moy makes off with the money um so there's a lot of questions about business here about how involved this shave is going on here uh also one wonders almost whether uh the, if he's putting down uh, uh anything to, to to cover the front uh you know that he's almost tying this his victim down into the chair we've had barber business before Ooh. more than once um, so this has these uh, these little uh, uh, sort of precedents, as it were, um, that at some point we'll get around to doing sort of a little uh, side by side view uh, as we, I am collecting all the barber barber routines. Um, so, yeah, lots of potential business, lots of things um, going on here. Thoughts from the room uh, about this. Uh, who wants to leap in first? I'll go to Lois, then Alan. One thing occurs to me, which is simply that that stage direction content might come right at the end here when Mulligrub actually asks for music. I mean, he, uh, he tells them to, to play something because it seems very odd at the point where it comes. I mean, unless Cockle de Moy gives some sort of signal for music when he leaves or asks them to play to cover up whatever he's doing when he gets out of there. I mean, it, 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 it might make more sense if it was just a line or two earlier that, you know, he's sitting there and maybe he sings to himself or something while he's waiting for something to happen. Because he's sort of sitting there expectantly talking to the barber over his shoulder. And, you know, it, it's the fact that it comes immediately after he's sort of going, where's the barber gone? When you feel like it, it needs to move on. Mm. Um, uh, there. I mean, I'm looking at uh, uh, a couple of modern editions where... They've just put it as a, as a sings to himself kind of cue at that point. But you're right. I don't think that quite lands there um, as, as, a, as your pucker cue uh, for music. Um, yeah. Uh, Alan. Yeah, I mean, the, the odd thing is that there's almost a complete change of verbal style here from what we had yesterday. Um, and... When we first got that speech from Mistress Mulligrub, my immediate reaction is, what the hell has she been smoking? <laughs> you know, she, she seems to be on a completely different planet somewhere. Uh, Helen? Uh, yeah, I, I was going back to the music. I think, I mean, it's off the cantat is after he asks for musicians, isn't it? It must be. I would have thought it, yep. it's got mm. misplaced. Um, there's a lot of religious stuff, old religion and new religion, and, and which I hadn't, as we went through, I tried to work out but couldn't. Mm. Um, I suppose it's time to come up with my theory. I have this theory that Englishmen weren't called Andrew. And if mm -hmm. you ever come across an Andrew, it's because he's a Scot or because he's, um, he's in this case, pretending to be a Scot. I mean, yes. he says he's going to be a Northerner, which would include Scots. Yes, there's an earlier scene where he debates what kind of accent to use and decides to be a Northern barber so that he takes the name Andrew. I think there must have been a view that all Scots were named Andrew. Mm. Well, certainly people who weren't Scots weren't named Andrew. Mm. 
Hmm. which is more or less the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, you know, if we're following St. Andrew as, you know, the patron saint, um, then, that, you know, that, that seems to be a logical signifier on that front. And it gives us an act, it uh, gives the actor a choice of, act, you know, uh, 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 an accent to play um, that would be recognisable, uh, uh, especially with the, the, you know, the date of where this is landing as well, you know, in the uh, the, the, the very... Uh, opening gambit of uh, of James uh, James's reign, so uh, Scottishness is is very much in in vogue at the moment. Um, uh, I'm just on that music thing. Yeah, there's definitely music at the end of this uh, scene because it's the end of the act, and therefore it's a cue for the in- the mini interval. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're they're including a music cue within. It is a question whether that notation earlier is is just that misplaced cue, uh, or or whether we're something's got confused in the transmission um uh, so so it could be it could be both a music cue um or just as a uh interpreted as uh Mully grub singing a little song to himself perhaps as i say i i think that's a production decision i'm i i don't think we need to be authoritative on that uh, eric then alan yeah the the line is there any fiddlers in the house just made me think of the the you know early modern well not early modern sorry the the modern cartoon equivalent of is there a doctor in the house and then obviously sort of you yeah. know the cartoon equivalent cuz Molly Grubbs not having a good day um yeah. you know this this is this is bad uh situation uh you know this uh, money was going to you know be used for a purpose that's is 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 really out of pocket um it's all a bit mean Really, uh, Alan. I'm just wondering whether that, where the placing of that cantat is actually from the prompt copy, which is basically a clue, cue to the stage manager: get the musicians out of the blasted bar. Mm. <laughs> mm. Uh, well, there's a uh, there's a footnote here that uh, uh, some people have suggested that maybe it's actually a typo and it should be uh, more for uh, uh, clamat, uh, as in shouts at that point. <laughs> <laughs> that there might be some ad lib shout- shouting. That is one interpretation. There are other interpretations available. Um, but yes, obviously, for more barbershop action, uh, there's uh, Damon and Pythias and uh, Promus and Cassandra that we've already done. Um, there's something else as well, I think, uh, in though not as developed. Um, yeah, maybe one of Lily. Hmm. Yeah, if you know, there's the Barber Surgeons Hall. Uh, at some point, you could propose an evening to them of a, a great. <laughs> great scenes about barbers <laughs> see what they say <laughs> yeah I, I i don't know how how much you could you could string that out just one after another but uh, i definitely would like to workshop the, the just the nature of the business uh of, of of it um whether i'd make an audience sit there for an hour <laughs> here's another great barber scene <laughs> yeah. i've done stranger things in my time so who knows uh elizabeth yeah, I was wondering what the likelihood of Holly Furness getting his furniture back is, because uh, it was taken from him, and it was and it was told he would bring it back. But I don't think that's going to happen. Mm. Mm. No, no, probably not. No, <laughs> I mean... stop it. Yeah. And it's just, uh, you know, the, when the description comes around and it's just, ah, oh, it's cockled him eye again. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, not having a good day. Not having a good day. Um, Helen and then Alan. We don't know what the £15 is about. I mean, it's just a sort of random £15 in a bag, is it? Uh, yeah. Alan. Yeah, on, on the £15, the opening scene <clears throat> ah. was that Cockledy Moy had run off with a whole collection of plate from Mully Grubb's Park. And the 15 quid was explicitly there to go and replace some or all of that. Mm. Um, so I think that, that explains that bit. I'll just pop over to Lynn. I'll come back to you, Alan. Yeah, basically, I'm, I was going to say more or less what Alan was saying, that um, as I remember, the um, uh, Cockle de Moy lifted three drinking vessels is all. Um, in the first scene. So I was wondering if this is at all sort of historically accurate that replacing those going to cheap side to a pewterers or whatever, it's going to cost five pounds a piece for, uh, for, for barware. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, 
manufactured items were much more expensive, relatively speaking, because everything was handmade. And like, you know. mm. Today in bars, they, you know, they break three mm. or four or a, do a, a dozen glasses a night and it's no big deal. Mm. But like having three pewter mugs stolen was, was a significant loss. But I'm wanting five pounds a piece if, if he's going to just replace three of them. So I was wondering if anybody had a sense of what yeah. things cost back then. Helen. I have just spent £24 at the Hampton Court gift shop on a pewter drinking vessel, <laughs> in case it's of any interest to anybody. It's Can we see it? It's still in my bottom of my suitcase, so no, okay. but tomorrow maybe. Okay. Uh, so, well, so not quite the answer we were expecting, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but, but it makes me feel really happy because I, I'm a complete menace in a gift shop. I can't, I, I yeah. yeah, it's always like, get out the credit card and like, that much? Well. Yeah, we've all been there. Uh, I'll go to Alan and then Elizabeth and we'll move on. Yeah, on the question of the uh, Holofernes uh, barber's equipment, I suspect that one way of handling that would be simply as soon as he grabs the sack of money, Cocker de Moy legs it and leaves the bowl and razors behind. Mm. Which would make sense because he's got no further use for them. Mm. Or has he? Mm. Or has he? Ah, yes. There may be more, more, more business to come. Uh, but yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, I was just speaking to what Lynn was saying about the number of pewter goblets that were stolen. I know in the text it said a nest or a niece. And I was wondering how many is a nest? Do we know? No, that's really odd because normally a nest of tables, for example, means, you know, maybe three tables, one of which, each one of which is slightly smaller than the other so that they can all uh, fit together. You know, one goes under the, the other one. Mm. And you could have a nest of goblets on the same principle, obviously, if they were all, if one fitted inside the other. But I don't know if that's what it means. Yeah, the footnote I've got here is, uh, suggests a stack of drinking bowls. So uh, that's that seems, um, yeah, that they, they, they are a set. They're a special set, not just uh, random, random uh, furniture, as it were. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, excellent. Um, let us find out more. Let's gather more data as we uh, uh, we go to uh, a, a different uh, selection of people. We go into Act Three. Act three, scene one. Enter Beatrice, uh, Crispinella, and Nurse. Oh, it's got actually it has a name. Uh, Butifer. Nay, hey, good child of love. Once more, Master Freeville's sonnet on the kiss you gave him. Shut, shut, good nurse. And uh, uh, sings or reads. Purest lips, soft banks of blisses, self alone deserving kisses. Oh, give me leave to. Pish, sister Beatrice, pray they read no more. My stomach allayed stands against kissing extremely. Why, good Crispinella? Why the faith and trust I bear to my face tis grown one of the most unsavory ceremonies, body of beauty. Tis the, one of the most unpleasing injurious customs to ladies. <laughs> Any fellow that has but one nose on his face and standing collar and skirts also fine, lined with uh, taffety sarsenet must salute us on the lips as fam familiarly. Soft skin save us. There was a stub bearded John of style with a ployed in his face and saluted me last day and stuck, struck his bristles through my lips. I had 10 shillings in pomptum since that to skin them again. Marry, if a nobleman or a knight with one lock visit us, though his unclean goose turd green teeth had the palsy, his nostrils smell worse than a putrefied marrowbone and his loose beard drops into our bosom, yet still we must kiss him with a cursey, cursey a curse. For my part, I believe they would break wind in my lips. Fie, Crispinella, you speak too broad. <laughs> No jot, sister. Let's ne'er be ashamed to speak what we not, be not ashamed to think. I dare as boldly speak venery as think venery. Faith, sister. I'll be gone if you speak so broad. Will you so? <laughs> now bashfulness sees you. We pronounce boldly robbery, murder, treason, which deeds must needs be far more loathsome. 
from an act which is so natural, just and necessary as that of procreation. You shall have an hypocritical vestal virgin speak that with closed teeth publicly, which, shall she, which she will receive with open mouth privately. For my own part, I consider nature without apparel, without disguising custom or compliment. I give words, I give thoughts, words, and words, truth, and truth, boldness. She whose honest freeness makes it her virtue to speak what she thinks will make it her necessity to think what is good. I love no prohibited things, and yet I would have nothing prohibited by policy, but by virtue. For as in the fashion of the time, those books that are called in are most in sale and request. So in nature, those actions are most prohibited and are most desired. Good quick sister, stay your pace. We are private, but the world would censure you. For truly severe modesty is women's virtue. Fie, fie, virtue is a free, pleasant, buxom quality. I love a constant countenance well, but this forward <laughs> Ignorant coyness, sour, austere, lumpish, uncivil privateness that promises nothing but rough skins and hard stools. <laughs> Fly on it. Good for nothing, but for nothing. Well, nurse, and what do you conceive of this? Robert. Right, sorry. Nay, faith, my conceiving days be done. Marry, <laughs> kissing, I'll defend that. That's within my compass. But for my own part, here's Mistress Beatrice is to be married with the grace of God. A fine gentleman he is, shall have her. And I warrant a strong. He has a leg like a post, a nose like a fine, a lion, a brow like a bull, and a beard of most fair expectation. This week you must marry him. And I will now read a lecture to you both, how you shall behave yourself to your husbands at the first month of your nuptial. I broke my skull about it, I can tell you, and there is much brain in it. Read it to my sister, good nurse, for I assure you I'll ne'er marry. Marry, God forbid, what will you do then? Faith, strive against the flesh. <laughs> marry, no faith, husbands are like lots in the lottery. You may draw 40 blanks before you find one that has any prize in him. A husband generally is a class, is a careless, domineering thing that grows like coral, which, as long as it is underwater, is soft and tender, but as soon as it has got his branch above the waves, is presently hard, stiff, not to be bowed, but burst. So when your husband is a suitor and under your choice, Lord, how supple he is, how obsequious, how at your service, sweet lady. Once married, got up his head above a stiff, crooked, knobby, inflexible, tyrannous creature he grows. Then they turn like water. More, more would you embrace the less you would you hold. I'll live my own woman, and if the worst comes to the worst, I, I had rather prove a wag than a fool. Oh, but a virtuous marriage. Virtuous marriage? There is no more affinity betwixt virtue and marriage than betwixt a man and his horse. <laughs> Indeed, virtue gets up on marriage sometimes and manages it in the right way. But marriage is of another piece, and for as a horse it may be without a man and a man without a horse, so marriage, you know, is often without virtue, and virtue, I am sure, more oft without marriage. But thy match, sister, I might think it will do well. He's a well-shaved, clean-lipped gentleman of a handsome but not affected fineness, a good faithful eye, a well-humoured cheek. But he did not stoop in the shoulders for thy sake. Here, see, here he is. And yes, the scene is interrupted by the arrival of uh, Freeville, etc. <laughs> Uh, yes, so uh, I just want to briefly pause there to just take in the uh, the thoughts of uh, of uh, Chairperson Chris Benella. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, thoughts in the room on 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 them. Uh, Lynn first. Uh, uh, doesn't Chris Benella have some great things to say? What a fun scene for that particular actor. I I mean, I just, I, I'm like, this is, this is the Marston that I love is the way he, he takes something that's kind of a cliche. It's a, it's, it's a, a, a talking point that we see in the culture, like the fact that, you know, men are all about at your service before you get married, but once they're the husband and the head of the household, um, 
all of your room for maneuver and your your leverage as a as a woman is gone. Uh, and we've heard that before in other early modern texts. Um, but there's the way that the choral analogy that's that's so original. And you know, virtue and marriage are like a man in his horse. Where does he come up with this stuff? I just think it's so smart. <laughs> Uh, Elizabeth, then Eric. Um, her Chris Benella's first speech is something else. The line that she gives about I Liz leave, they would break wind in my lips was so, so good. I was like, oh my gosh. She's like, I was like, Marston is really shocking in this. So I like yeah. Chris Benella a lot. Yeah, he, he has does. a point. It does drop some zingers, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, uh, Eric. Yeah, I think this is very much sort of <laughs> the whole, um, when the nurse went, and now I will read a lecture to you both, my brain went pneumaticus, just sort of, oh God, no, not glass of government again. Um, <laughs> and just sort of Chris Brunella doing saying all that stuff. It's like, there's no point in being very uh, coy about all this. I mean, you know, you're going to be married soon. There's, you know, there's, I don't know, it just, it was so much fun to read. Mm. Uh, other thoughts in the room before we rejoin the scene? As, uh, as, as uh, Frida, et cetera, enter. Uh, uh, Rachel. Um, so Chris Pinella's frankness when it comes to, you know, sex and virginity and all these things, um, I think this is just interesting in this play that, there, there is this discussion about um, what people think is a proper woman because we have, uh, you know, women who are in the, you know, their career is prostitution or their job is prostitution. And this, um, you know, talk about, you know, that's frank about, you know, freedom and, and marriage and things like this from a woman who um, uh, doesn't have the, doesn't have the job of prostitution, you know, and is, uh, I guess, uh, from a family that I guess Freeville sees as respectable enough to marry one of their daughters, uh, I think gives what she's saying to the audience. Maybe it's more shocking from her because she's of a good family standing, or maybe it lends more credence to it because she holds more power in the power structure, even if she's not at the top because she is a woman. Um, Alan, then Eric. I must admit, I'm getting a bit of a flashback because Chris Brunella is coming across in very didactic terms, which are not dissimilar to how Malheur came across in the early, say, the very early scenes of the play. And I'm just wondering whether we've got a, a setup, effectively, of yet another one who starts off with extremely <coughs> decided views and then falls for the dark side. Let us see where the play takes yeah, us on that. Yeah. Eric, then Lois. I was just going to say that it reminds me a bit of, uh, I think it was What You Will or something else, where, you know, another Marston play where we had sort of this whole setup of two sisters um, who were quite, had quite different fates by the end of the, the sort of, one of them was quite liberal and sort of fully in love with everyone that her nurse suggested, and the other one was quite sort of, love of my life uh over the top <coughs> kind of thing um, uh lois muted at present uh lynn were you waving as well uh, uh yeah i was just going to say that's a really nice sort of um prediction of alan's that we had Mallorer saying oh lust is bad and then he falls and we have chris Pinella saying i'll never get married that may very well signal that yeah, she's not going to be able to live up to that. The difference between Chris Pinella and Mallory is, is Chris Pinella is so vivacious. She's so vital. And Mallory is a little bit of a wet blanket. <laughs> yeah, Lois. Well, Mallory's views actually changed in that last speech of his. In fact, they, they've been changing and they became much closer, in fact, to Chris Pinella's. And that's because they're both quoting Montaigne, essentially. I mean, uh, you know, Marston did, did really get very impressed, I think, with Montaigne's essays and they they do make points about how we're we're always willing to talk about murder and you know horrible things, but not willing to talk about uh, sex and uh, uh, bodily functions. And uh, there, there's quite a lot of this that, that is Montaigne, and uh, uh, I think that's one reason why she sounds a bit didactic as well, because she's 
she's talking in a sense like somebody writing an essay. But uh, she manages to, to put it off with such a lan. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. Um, okay. Let's uh, let's move uh, forward as uh, yes, uh, joining the scene. Enter Freeville and Tisfew. Tisfew. Them. Good day, sweet. Good morrow, brother. Nay, you shall have my lip. Good sir. Good morrow, servant. Good morrow, sweet life. Life? Dost call thy mistress life? Life, yes, why not life? How many mistresses has, hast thou? Some nine. Why, then thou hast nine lives, like a cat. <laughs> Mew, you would be taken up for that. Nay, good, let me still sit. We low statures love still to sit. Lest when we stand, we may be supposed to sit. <laughs> Dost not wear high cork shoes and shoppings? Most monstrous ones I am, as many other are, pieced above and pieced beneath. <laughs> Still, the best part in the... And yet all will scarce make me so high as one of the giant stilts that stalks before my lord mayor's pageant. <laughs> By the lord, I thought so. I, so I thought was something Mistress Joyce jested at thy high insteps. She might well enough and long enough before I would be ashamed of my shortness. What I made or can mend myself, I may blush at. What, but what nature put on me, let her be ashamed for me. I had nothing to do with it. I forget my beauty. Faith Joyce is a foolish, bitter creature. A pretty, moldy wench she is. And fair. As myself. Oh, you forget your beauty now. Charles, I never remember my beauty, but as some men do religion, for con controversy's sake. A motion, sister. Nineve, Julius Caesar, Jonas, or the destruction of Jerusalem. My love, here. Prithee, call him not love, to still drab's phase, phrase, nor sweet honey, nor my coney, nor dear duckling. They are citizen terms, but call him... What? Anything. What's the motion? You know this night our parents have intended solemnly to contract us, and my love, to grace the feast, have promised a mask. Yon hope one, tie the few, and Cacatur shall fill up a room. For heaven well remembered, he borrowed a diamond of me last night to grace his finger in your visitation. The lying creature will swear some strange thing on it now. And enter Cacatur. Peace, he's here. Stand close, lurk. <laughs> a good morrow, most dear and worthy to be most wise. How does my mistress? Morrow, sweet servant, you glister. Pretty, let's see that stone. <laughs> a toy, lady, I bought to please my finger. Why, I am more precious to you than your finger. Oh, yes, or than all my body, I swear. Why, then let it be bought to please me. Come, I am no professed beggar. Troth, mistress, zounds, forsooth, I, I protest. <laughs> Nay, if you turn protestant for such a toy. In good deed, La. Another time I'll give you... Uh, is this yours to give? Oh, God, forsooth, my, mine, quoth he. Nay, as for that... Uh, now I remember, I have seen this on my servant Tisiphus' finger. Um, such another. Nay, I am sure this is it. <laughs> Troth, tis, forsooth. Um, the poor fellow wanted money to pay for supper last night, and so pawned it to me. Uh, tis a pawn, Faith, or else you should have had it. Hark ye, thou base lying! How dare thy impudence hope to prosper? Were it not for the privilege of this respected company, I would so bang thee! Come um, hither, servant. What's the matter betwixt you two? Oh, nothing. Uh, but hark ye, he did me summon civil discourtesies last night, for which, because I should not call him to account, he desires to make me my satis any satisfaction. A coward trembles at my very presence, for I have him on the hip. I'll take the forfeit on his ring. What's that you whisper to her? Ah, uh, nothing, sir, uh, but satisfy her that the ring was not pawned, but only lent by you to grace my finger, and so told her I crave pardon for being too familiar or indeed overbold with your reputation. Yes, indeed he did. He said you desired to make him any satisfaction for an uncivil discourtesy you did him last night. 
But he said that you ha he had you owe the hip and would take the forfeit of your ring. How now, ye base poltroon? <laughs> hold, hold. <laughs> My mistress speaks by contraries. Contraries? Uh, she jests, Faith. <laughs> Only jests. <laughs> Sir, I'll know more of your service. You are a child. I'll give you to my nurse. And he come to me, I can tell you, as old as I am, what to do with him. I offer my service, forsooth. Why so? Now every dog has his bone to gnaw on. The mask holds, Master Cockatoura. I'm ready, sir. Mistress, I'll dance with you. Ne'er fear, I'll grace you. I tell you, I can my singles and my doubles, my trick of 20, my canter pace, my traverse forward, and my falling back. Yes, your face. Mine. The provision for the night is ours. Much must be our care till night we leave you. I am your servant. Be not tyrannous. Your virtue won me. Faith, my love's not lust. Good, wrong me not. My most fault is much trust. Until night only, my heart be with you. Farewell, sister. Adieu, brother. Come on, sister, for these sweetmeats. Let's meet and practice presently. Content. We'll but fit our pumps. Come, ye pernicious vermin. And everybody exits apart from Freeville. Um, there's a lot of stuff to unpack here um, <laughs> about what's going on. And it's sort of, it does ask questions about what actually the setting for this scene is from the very beginning, from that, that the, 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 the dialogue that we had between the sisters and the nurse at the beginning. So this whole, you know, we brought up a mask and there's lots of elements in this scene actually where it feels like, and I can't remember actually the timeline here, whether it's a call back or a call forward to other things that Marston has done. Um, you know, Marston has played with masks and uh, in, in, in plays and other uh, situations. We've got a character talking about uh, how many mistresses he has. We've had that in, uh, in another text as well. You know, there's lots of little, little details here. So is it actually that the entertainment that we're talking about here is already, you know, the, the, the party's already underway uh, or is it happening or are they planning it? Because um, it almost felt like actually what they're doing is they're getting dressed and ready for 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 an event that's sort of just over there, and that they're then sort of starting to go for it. Or is it actually no? That's still planned for slightly further in the future. I I was got very confused as to where we were with that because that makes a big difference to how you stage this scene, uh, Lois. Yeah, well, I think I mean Freeville just says let's meet and practice presently, and then they're going to put their dancing shoes on. So I take it that's a rehearsal for something they're going to perform, presumably, at the wedding of uh, Freeville and Beatrice. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so it's still it's all because there's lots of these sort of t this talk mention of emotion and they're promising a mask. And it, it's like it's like because people are splitting off into planning groups or something. You know, it's, It feels like there's there's lots of spinning plates going on in this scene. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll go back to Lois, then uh, Alan, then Eric. Yeah, I mean, what, what I found confusing in this scene is just who's talking to whom, because mm. I took it at the beginning, maybe Kakatur didn't see that Tisafu was there, because uh, in that case, he was telling everybody this was his <clears throat> ring. And then when he realizes <clears throat> that the guy that lent him the ring is actually in the room, he has to s then tell uh, Chris Benella privately that uh, uh, that he got it in one way, and then he tells yeah, Tisafu right. something else. But I'm not sure, maybe even at the beginning, he was talking just to her. Mm. Yeah, there does seem to be a, 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 a lot of shifting two different people uh, through this uh, that are aren't is not currently marked in in the scripts that we've uh, we've got here uh, and lots of little confusing dialogues you know just that, that are not fully explicated as to precisely how that dialogue works actually because mm. they've got these you know uh, little moments where you're not quite sure actually how how that flows uh, Alan then Eric then Liz. yeah I mean it, it's interesting we're already seeing a change in Chris Benella's character having come out with that long spiel of what you could almost describe as Miss Andre. Um, she's now great enjoying stirring up trouble between the chaps um, for her own amusement. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Eric, then Lynn. Yeah, I was going to say that she, but like the thing that stays constant 
important is that she's quite confident about what she's doing. Sort of, um, she goes, "Yeah, I'm short, but who cares? I mean, I can't, I can't fix that, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna feel embarrassed about that." And she has that similar attitude to like um, when she talks about her sexuality beforehand, like before, as well. Um, and I, I don't know, she's just so clearly painted compared to the other ones. Um, I mean, definitely compared, like Beatrice is very you know, com comparing to trust kind of thing, um, I guess. Uh, they're very, very opposite <laughs> in terms of characters. Yeah, you, br you bring up the shoes. Uh, you know, she's got high cork shoes. Uh, she's, she's wearing uh, <laughs> a, a, a elevation and there, there, there may be other uh, uh, the elements as well that we uh, will be able to infer from the text. So, um, yeah, the, 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 the interesting details that the, the costumier can uh, can take on, on board as well. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, I just really like Eric's observation. Um, but I was going to say that I, yeah, I think Lois is right. Chris Benalla on Cavatura's entrance says, peace, quiet, he's here, stand close, lurk. And close doesn't mean nearby, it means secret or hidden. So get out of view and i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, i i i'm gonna troll <laughs> a cockatoo a little bit uh, so i think when just a few says harky thou base lying how dare thy impudence hope to prosper i think he's sort of coming out of his he's hiding behind a post he's hiding behind a piece of furniture he's he's out of sight that he, so he comes forward and, and says that and then the, you know there are other sides that that uh, Lois mentioned. That, yeah, I think she's got that about right. That not everyone in the room hears everything that everyone is is saying. So that needs to be sorted out. But I think it would be very funny once you did get that sorted out. Yeah, it it it, it does have really nice dynamism. The the scene it has, and, and Marston's quite good at making these sort of flowy scenes where people are talking and moving and, and, and they're over there and then they're over there and the focus shifts. He's very good at that and th this is quite nicely done. Uh, Helen, muted at present. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> um, sorry, I, I'm, not, I'm not entirely here today. Look, uh, Chris Benella is not only wearing Chopin She's also dressed her hair very high. Mm. <laughs> I think that I think that's I think that's there in the text as well. Mm. Yes, there's there's there's, there's different uh, there's a, there's a big height thing that's that's going on uh, there. Um, so yeah, there's there's an aesthetic to be playing with here. Uh, we have a little bit more of this scene to go, but it's effectively a little mini scenette um, because it's just between Freeville, who has been left on stage, and uh, uh, enter Malharu uh, to him uh, as we close the scene. My friend, wished hours. What news from Babylon? How does the woman of sin and natural concupiscence? The eldest child of nature's ne'er beheld so damned a creature. What? In no refer to animus mutatus dissere formas? Which way bears the tide? Dear loved sir, I find the mind courageously vicious may be put on a desperate security, but can never be blessed with a firm and joy and self-satisfaction. What passion is this, my dear Linda Brides? Tis well, we both may jest, have been tempted to your death. What? Is the rampant cockatrice grown mad for the loss of her man? Devilishly mad. As most assured of my second love. Right. She would have this, she would have, she would have had this ring. Aye, and this heart, and in true proof you were slain. I should bring her this ring from which she was assured you would not part until from life you parted. For which deed, and only for which deed, I should possess her sweetness. Oh, bloody villains! Nothing is defamed but by his proper self. Physicians abuse remedies, lawyers spoil the law, and women only shame women. You have vowed my death? My lust, not I, before my reason would. Yet I must use her. That I, a man of sense, should conceive endless pleasure in a body whose soul I know to be so hideously black. 
that a man at 23 should cry, oh, sweet pleasure, and at 43 should sigh, oh, sharp pox. But consider man furnished with omnipotence, and you overthrow him. Thou must cool thy impatient appetite. Tis fate, tis fate. I do malign my creation that I am subject to passion. I must enjoy her. I have it, Mark. I give a mask tonight to my love's kindred, in that thou shalt go, in that we too make show of falling out. Give seeming challenge, instantly depart, with some suspicion to present fight. We will be seen as going to our swords, and after meeting, this ring only lent, I'll lurk in some obscure place till rumor, the common bod to loose suspicion, have feigned me slain, which in respect myself will not be found, and our late seeming quarrel will quickly sound to all as earnest truth. Then to thy wench, protest me surely dead, show her this ring, enjoy her, and cold blood will laugh at folly. Oh, but think of it. Think of it. Come away, virtue, let's sleep thy passions. What old times, how this crimes are now but fashions. And they exit, uh, having um, put forward opinions of the most charming and um, lovely guys. No, no. Oh, God. OK. Uh, I, as ever, we're hoping with Marston that, you know, he's taking us somewhere here. Um, so, yeah. Um, uh, Lynn. All together now. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there, there are, there are, yeah, because <laughs> it's just, yeah, uh, Eric. Well, it does seem a bit like, um, I can't remember, is this before the, the, the one that we did or after? I mean, chronologically speaking, because it, it's printed in uh, 1605, this one is printed in 1605, but like, it's very much that thing of, I'm going to go kill my friend now, and then he, he doesn't, he just shoots a blank, so it's a, his friend in the last scene, uh, with, Sir Brabant and all that stuff, um, <laughs> if that rings a bell. Um, and yeah, sort of, I don't know, it's like nothing can possibly go wrong. Yeah, they're, they're just suddenly, they're so charming. Um, and, you know, whole questions of consent just, just flying through, out the window there. Um, yeah. Um, they, they come across as, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's one of those questions of of how the flow of the play goes and how that lands, especially for a modern audience today. Of just going, this is the, this is the point where if if you were with either of these guys, you you might you might be uh, uh, yeah uh, re reviewing that situation. Uh, Helen then Lois. Yes, it's not your typical uh, situation, though. I mean, she has said kill your friend and my former lover and I will sleep with you. That's morally dubious in my opinion. Indeed. <laughs> and in fact, duping her by pretending to kill your friend and then sleeping with her is not possibly the worst thing he could do. Discuss. Uh, Lois. Yeah. I mean, I've heard worse is what I'm saying. Mm. Now, that's more or less what I was going to say. I mean, it is consensual, in fact. I mean, she will be agreeing to it. She won't know the truth about what he's done, but nevertheless, uh, she said she would sleep with him. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, other thoughts? Uh, anyone want to uh, leap in on that 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 uh, question? Or other questions? Elizabeth? So I think that we've got like a really nice range of female characters in this text. Because on the one extreme, you've got Francesquina, who is, I think she's the eponymous character, who is who has a very sort of dominant sort of character. And then you've got Crispinella on the other extreme, who uh, we may, may protest too much, um, that she doesn't want to marry and the men are horrible and things like that and then we've got um the nurse and we have um what's the other character uh beatrice as well so i think we have quite a nice range of female characters and that they have different social standings as well which is quite nice when they interact 
Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the, the, the advantages that the, uh, a, a boys' company will have is that they can, uh, they can uh, uh, have a, a greater range of uh, male-female balance uh, in terms of characters. So they've really got that, that, that advantage in, in, in place. Um, yeah, there's a lovely range there. Um, Eric? I find it interesting how, like, you know, we've had this set up with the ring. We had, like, the sort of... Um, well, we had the ring from someone else being borrowed and stuff, and that that kind of blew up in their face. But yeah, it reminded me of also uh, I think it was Solomon and Priscilla, where some it's like yeah, take this ring for or jewel, whatever it was, for good luck, and the fellow then proceeds to lose it and has to go cry the whole town for it. Mm. Um, yeah, it just kind of it's an interesting content. Yes, here is a plot device. Uh, um, <laughs> please use it wisely. Uh, nothing can go wrong with this plot device. Um, I'm sure it will will drive some plot. Um, uh, uh, any other thoughts? Anyone else want to leap in? Um, Valentina, how was it reading uh, reading your uh, reading that chap at that particular moment? Mm, I wasn't really expecting because I wasn't here yesterday. I wasn't really expecting it to be just yeah no. It was hard to put the words out yeah even though he doesn't actually do the planning but just like i must have her like it's just like oh, so objectifying mm. um so uh let's see uh how uh that functions within the the matrix of the characters and the situation and the context of the play as we go forward uh, as we're going to dive back to uh shall we call it the b plot or should we call it the a plot depending on which plot you prefer i suppose um uh the hinterland of this play might call this the a plot uh act three scene two enter uh we've got um well that's an interesting variation uh yes uh master burnish and lionel uh master mullygrub with a standing cup in his hand and an obligation in the other uh cockle de moy stands at the other door disguised this time like a french peddler and overhears them i am not at this time furnished but there's my barn for your plate your bill had been sufficient you are a good man a standing cup parcel gilt of 32 ounces, 11 pounds, 7 shillings, the 1st of July. Good plate, good man, good day, good all. Tis my hard fortune. I will hang the knave. No, first he shall half rot in fetters in the dungeon, his conscience made despairful. I'll hire a knave a purpose, shall assure him he is damned, and after see him with mine own eyes hanged without singing any song. Lord, that he has but one neck. You are too tyrannous. You'll use me no further? Uh, uh, no, sir. Um, lend me your servant only to carry the plate home. I have an occasion of an hour's absence. With easy consent, sir. Haste and be careful. Burnish. Uh, be very careful, I pray thee, uh, to my wife's own hands. Secure yourself, sir. To her own hand. Fear not, I have delivered greater things than this to a woman's own hand. Monsieur, please you to buy a fine, a delicate ball, sweet ball, a camphor ball. Ready, away. And exit Lionel. When a ball to scour, a scouring ball, a ball to be shaved. By the love of God, talk not of shaving. I have been <laughs> shaved. Mischief and a thousand devils seize him. I have been shaved. And exit Mullygrub. The fox grows fat when he is cursed. I'll shave ye smoother yet. Turd on a tile stone. My lips have a kind of room at this bowl. I'll have it. I'll gargleize my throat with this vintner. And when I have done with him, spit him out. I'll shock. Conscience does not repine. Were I to bite an honest gentleman, a poor groger and poet, or a 
penurious parson that hath but ten pigs' tails in a twelve month, and for want of learning hath but one good stool in a fortnight, I were damned beyond the works of supererogation. But to wring the withers of my gouty, barmed, spigot, frigging jumbler of elements, mully grub, I hold it as lawful as sheep shearing, taking eggs from hens, caudles from asses, or buttered shrimps from horses. They make no use of them, were not provided for them, and therefore, worshipful cockledamoy, hang toasts. On in grace and virtue to proceed, only beware. Beware degrees. There be rounds in a ladder and knots in a halter. Wear carts. Hang toast. The common council has decreed it. I must draw lots for the great goblet. And exit. Okay, we've got some lovely, lovely bits of uh, language uh, flying in there. Uh, I I quite like the way that Mullygrub is sort of just triggered and, and runs away. Um, just the moment you mentioned shaving, it's just, uh, no, no, ah, had enough of that. Uh, interesting uh, textual variant question uh, of the name of Burnish, um, uh, because the text is contradictory at times. Uh, so you can go for Burnish, if you like Burnish, but you can also have Garnish as an alternative for that character's name uh so uh, uh just 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 uh, there there is no absolute answer to what that character's name is uh stage stage direction character uh, uh speech prefix and um the uh the actual uh list of roles uh contradict each other so um yeah options helen this is a serious piece of plate mm. the standing cup parcel guilt that means it's a heavy very solid uh, cup on a, a, a foot, um, a 32 ounces, and it's silver, but it's not only silver, it's parcel gilt, so it is highly de decorated with gold. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, 11 pounds, seven shillings, and that's a, now if, 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 um, Cockledamoy got away with anything similar, then he's really. But it's fifteen um, pounds, we were told. Well, he's maybe he's buying other pieces. No, that he, that he, particular piece is eleven pounds seven shillings. Yeah, but he got away with fifteen pounds in coin. In, in co the barber oh, scene. Oh, oh yes, in coin as well, but also the. Um, Mm. The, the 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 plate that he went out of the window with mm. Mm. yeah we've got to be said mullygrub is really down uh here mm. you know he's he's re you know or potentially down uh quite a lot here i mean this this is this uh, if i was him i would just have a really quiet week now you know i just just bread and bread and water um just just not 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 it's it's like you know he can't help but involve himself in more more things which are clearly not this is not the week for this yeah. clearly not the week for this um bless um so yeah we get um uh cockle de Moy, uh doing this this sort of lengthy speech uh full of some wonderful uh gouty bomb spigot frigging jumbler of elements i mean there's some tongue twisters in there i quite like that as a warm-up um turd on a tile stone um that's one to use in day-to-day -day life. <laughs> Lynn. So, um, yeah, so Kako de Moy has an interesting thesis when he says, were I to bite an honest gentleman, I were damned. But to wring the withers of my grub is as lawful as sheep shearing or taking eggs from hens. So I wouldn't cheat an honest man. You can't cheat an honest man, says What's his new name? Um, uh, but Molly Grubb is a cheat himself, so cheating a cheater isn't really cheating. I wonder if that's what the play is trying to tell us, because there is a parallel going on in the other plot where um, to trick Francesquina into sleeping with Malerer um, isn't really wrong because she tried to get Malerer to kill someone. So doing bad things to bad people isn't bad. 
I wonder if the play is going to really end up endorsing that or if it's going to complicate that claim a little bit. Yeah. Have we had any particular evidence that Molly Grubb is, uh, is, shall we say, inverted commas, bad? I mean, that, that, that's a question because uh, uh, I've, I've forgotten uh, what may have happened yesterday. I'll go to Lynn on that, then Lois, who's kind of muted. He does say something to his wife, do something with a vengeance. Like, basically, we're going to have to up the rate at which we cheat our patrons in order to make up for this loss. So there are pretty strong implications from him that, yeah, it's a regular practice with him to overcharge people. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Lois, you're muted at present. Um, so, yeah, it's that, that question of whether the punishment fits the crime. It, it does Because uh, oh, the, the problem is Cockle Moy could just come across as just this terrific asshole uh, who's just <laughs> doing this for n not really a very good reason. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, which, you know, can be fun if you do it, if you pitch it right. Um, but, yeah, whether... The play gives us quite enough data to to uh, go for this sort of uh, you know uh, cheater cheater thing, uh, Lois. Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, I mean, he's referred to as a crook right at the beginning of the play, even when they're pretending to condole with him over his latest loss. But uh, I think then there's a kind of basic assumption that I think all tavern keepers inflate the bill anyway, and they're all crooks. But even so, I don't know. Yeah, it kind of asks you to. Uh, is it really okay to say, oh, well, I've cheated this person six times and practically bankrupted him, but he was horrible anyway, so it's okay. Mm. Okay, let's continue with this plot line as we continue uh, staying in, in home with the uh, the Mully Grubs. Um, so, uh, uh, and in a sense, this this could be almost thought of as a continuation. Um, uh, exit, uh, Co Cockle de Moy. Act three, scene three. Enter Mistress Mully Grub and Lionel. With a goblet. May I pray you stay and drink? And how does your mistress? Oh, I know her very well. I have been inward with her, and so has many more. She was ever a good, patient creature. I, oh, faith, with all my heart, I'll remember your master, an honest man. He knew me before I was married. An honest man he is, and a crafty. He comes forward in the world well, I warrant him, and his wife is a proper woman that she is. Well, she has been a proper woman as any in cheap. She paints now, and yet she keeps her husband's old customers to him still. In troth, a fine-faced wife in a wainscot-carved seat is a worthy ornament to a tradesman's shop and unattractive i warrant her husband shall find it in the custom of his wear i'll assure him god be with you good youth i acknowledge the receipt and exit lionel presumably leaving the goblet behind with mistress mullygrub i acknowledge all the receipt sure it is very well spoken i acknowledge the receipt well thus it is to have good education and to be brought up in a tavern I do keep as gallant and as good company, though I, though I say it, as any she in London. Squires, gentlemen and knights diet at my table, and I do lend some of them money. And full many fine men go upon my score, as simple as I stand here, and I trust them. And truly, they very knightly and courtly promise fair. Give me very good words and a piece of flesh when time of the year serves. Nay, though my husband be a citizen and caps made of wool, yet I, I have wit and can see my good as soon as another, for I have all the things. My silly husband, alas, he knows nothing of it. Tis I that bear, tis I that must bear a brain for all. Enter Cockle de Moy. Hurrah to you, mistress. Hurrah, fine term. Faith, I'll score it upon an honour. Beautiful thought to you, sir. Your husband and my master, Mr. Burnish, have sent to you for a jole of fresh salmon. And they both will come to dinner to season your new cup with the best wine. Which cup your husband entreats you to send back by me that his arms may be graved on the side, which he forgot before it was sent. By what token are you sent? By no token? Nay, hey, I have wit. He sent me by the same token that he was dry shaved this morning. Ah, sad token, but true. 
Yes, sir. I pray you commend me to your master, but especially to your mistress. Tell them they shall be most sincerely welcome. And exit, uh, mistress, um, uh, leaving a uh, cockle demai. Shall be most sincerely welcome, worshipful cockle demai. Lurk close, hang toasts. Be not ashamed of thy quality. Every man's turd smells well in his own nose. Vanish, foist. And exit. Uh, we might uh, consider breaking this into a separate scene here, um, or it's a continuation. Re-enter Mistress Mullygrub with servants and furniture for the table. Come, spread these table diapers, napkins, and do you hear perfume this parlour? The so smell of profane tobacco. I could never endure this ungodly tobacco, since one of our elders assured me, upon his knowledge, tobacco was not used in the congregation of the family of love. Spread, spread handsomely. Lord, these boys do things are versy. You sure you're bringing up? I was a gentlewoman, which I was a gentlewoman by my sister's side. I can tell you so methodically. Oh, methodically. I wonder where I got that word. Oh, sir, I mean, Adab Ruth bade me kiss him methodically. I had it somewhere, and I had it indeed. Enter Master Mullygrub. Mind, be not desperate. I'll recover all. All things with me shall seem honest that can be profitable. They must ne'er winch that would or thrive or save. Be called niggard, cuckold, cutthroat, knave. Are they come, husband? Who? What? How now? What feast towards in my private parlour? Pray leave your foolery. What? Are they come? Come? Who come? You need not make so strange. Strange? I strange. You know no man that sent me word that he and his wife would come to dinner to me and sent this jewel of fresh salmon beforehand? Peace, not I. Peace. The messenger hath mistaken the house. Let's eat it up quickly before it be inquired for. Sit to it. Uh, some vinegar, quick. Ha! Huh. Some good luck yet. Ah, huh, faith, I never tasted salmon relish better. Oh, when a man feeds at other men's cost. At a man's cost? Why, did not you send this jowl of salmon? No. By Master Burnish men? No. Send me word that he and his wife would come to dinner to me? No, no. To season my new bowl? Bowl? And withal willed me to send the bowl back. Back. That you might have your arms graved on the side. Ah. By the uh, same token, you were dry shaven this morning before you went forth. Ah, how the salmon stinks. And thereupon sent the bowl back, prepared it in her name. I bear not a brain. Wife, do not vex me. Is the bowl gone? Is it delivered? Delivered, yes, sure it is delivered. I will never more say my prayers. Do not make me mad, tis common. Let me not cry like a woman. Is it gone? Gone? God is my witness. I delivered it with no more intention to be cozened on, on it than the child newborn, and yet... Look to my house. I'm haunted with evil spirits. Hear me, do, hear me. If I have not my goblet again, heaven... I'll to the devil, I'll to a conjurer. Look to my house, I'll raise all the wise men in the street. And exit Molly Grubb. Deliver us? What words are these? I trust in God he's but drunk, sure. Re-enter Cockledemoy. I must have the salmon too. Worshipful Cockledemoy, now for the masterpiece. God bless thy neck piece and futra. Fair mistress, my master. Have I caught you? What, Roger? Peace, good mistress, I'll tell you all. A jest, a very mere jest. Your husband only took sport to fright you. The bowl's at my master's, and there is your husband who sent me in all haste, lest you should be over frighted with his feigning to come to dinner to him. Praise heaven, it is no worse and desired me to desire you to send the jowl of salmon before and yourself to come after them 
My mistress would be right glad to see you. I pray carry it. Now thank them entirely. Bless me, I was never so out of my skin in my life. Pray thank your mistress most entirely. So now, figure, worshipful mouthful, and I will munch. Cheaters and boards go together like washing and wringing. And exit Coco de Moy. Beshrew his heart for his labour, how everything about me quivers. What, Christian, my hat and apron here, take me sleeves. And how I tremble, so I'll gossip it now for it, that's certain. Here has been revolutions and false fires indeed. Enter Molly Grub. Huh? Whither now? What's the matter with you now? Whither are you gadding? Come, come, play the fool no more, will you go? Whither? In the rank name of madness, whither? Whither? Why, to Master Burnish, to eat at the jaw of salmon. Lord, how strange you make it. Why so? Why so? Why so? Why, did you not you send the safe, the self-same fellow for the jaw of salmon that had the cup? Oh, tis well, tis very well. And willed me to come and eat it with you at the goldsmith's. Oh, aye, aye, aye. Art in thy right wits? Do you hear? Make a fool of somebody else, and you make an ass of me. I'll make an ox of you. Do you see? Hey, wife, uh, be patient. For look you, I may be mad or drunk or so. For my own part, though you can bear more than I, yet I can do well. I will not curse nor cry, but heaven knows what I think. Come, let's go hear some music. I will never more say my prayers. Uh, let's go hear some doleful music. Nay, if heaven forget to prosper knaves, I'll go no more to the synagogue. Now I am discontented, I'll turn sectary. That is fashion. And they exit. And once again, as it's the end of the act, Molly Grubb, uh, in a distraught fashion, says, let's, let's, let's have some music now. Music would be good. That might cheer me up. <laughs> yeah. uh, that would be, that would be really helpful. Um, so, yeah, there's... Uh, there's a, a lot going on here. Um, once again, Cockle de Moy comes in and steals uh, uh, something. Uh, but what's quite nice about this is he goes, actually, because he comes in with the salmon as a sort of, uh, as an in, as it were. Uh, and of course, he actually manages to nick that back as well. Uh, so it's uh, that thing. I, and it, it gives, it's important there, you know, that sort of note when Molly Grubb's saying, you know, pa, how this salmon stinks. He's going, you know, that's figurative. He's talking about its place in this room uh, he's not, it's not rotten or anything because if, if it was off then uh, Cockle de Moy wouldn't come back for it again um, so yeah it's, it's, it's this, this continuing gulling business that's going on and Cockle de Moy is showing off how clever he is by, by doing it twice in a row um, and, uh, and convincing people um, uh, Lois yeah. um, but uh, have I got this on? Yeah. Uh, mm. uh, but he's also, I mean, it shows Mullagrub's own uh, crooked behavior because as soon as he sees the salmon, of course, he starts eating it in case somebody else comes and realizes it was delivered to the wrong address. Uh, so uh, it's part of the, you know, he deserves to be cheated theme, I suppose. Uh, but it also, in a sense, it's his punishment too because he's so distracted by the idea of eating the salmon. He doesn't, he doesn't really go on to question her about the rest of that story. Not that it would do any good, but, uh, uh, you know, he just sort of seizes on the immediate opportunity to get something out of somebody else. Oh, this tastes so good since somebody else paid for it. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, he's very, very, very keen on uh, on the, the free food. Quick, before anyone comes it comes asking for it, you know, we mm -hmm. didn't receive any messages and we definitely didn't eat this delicious plump breasted pigeon. Uh, Lynn. Another thing about Molly Rubb I find rather troubling is that uh, he says a couple of times, I'm going to stop saying my prayers. Uh, if heaven forget to prosper knaves, I'll go no more to the synagogue. And I don't know whether that synagogue is a figure for church or whether he's supposed yeah. to be Jewish. Yeah. But the idea that um, I'm having all this bad luck where this, this guy keeps cheating me, and therefore I'm going to turn atheist rather than what the, the right thing to do. Like, I have to repent. I've been a dishonest person and maybe I deserve this and maybe I need to to fix my life and maybe bad things will stop happening to me if if 
I stop being a bad person. No, it's like I'm going to basically give, yeah, give up on God because he doesn't take care of me, even though I'm kind of a cheat myself. I'm not sure what to make of this, but I, it, it's it's pretty uncomfortable. Yeah, it, it's 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 a, it is a bit confused because uh, they, they talk about being the, the, the family of love and being uh, uh, and. and but they're also using anti-Semitic uh, uh, tropes uh, to, to, as something uh, derogatory about that what what they're doing. So it is a bit confused, um, and, it, and, and how that lands for us today um, uh, is is a slightly uh, uh, tricky thing to pass. Uh, I'll go to Lois on this. Yeah, well, his wife, his wife clearly belongs to the family of love, which is this uh, rather minor religious sect that gets sent up quite a lot and was always believed to be a hotbed of sex for everybody in it, I think. And yeah. uh, virtually everything his wife says is double entendre. I mean, she's she's this typical dumb city wife who is so obs apparently obsessed with sex that she's talking about it all the time without realizing it. I'm not sure whether the Mulligrub belongs to the family of love or not, but a lot of these groups, I think, did tend to talk as if they were the, the, the Old Testament world. I mean, the Puritans. Uh, you know, use a lot of names from the Old Testament. And I, I think calling the church a synagogue does not mean anything derogatory about Jews. It's just uh, just getting the more authentic term, perhaps, he thinks. Yeah, I, I, I think that's the thing. It's just for a modern audience in a production that might then yeah. land that in a, in a different direction. But I don't think that is its intent. Um, yeah. That doesn't mean that there isn't a sort of anti-Semitic vibe in the sense of you're talking, or the player's talking derogatorily to this sect, um, and using the word synagogue, synagogue it, it might be loaded in that a sense. Uh, and so there might be a, an association uh, in mind there, um, but not a direct one, if that makes sense. I think that's that's the way to pass that. Um, but I say, I don't think that's its primary thesis, if that makes sense. Uh, I'll go to Alan then. Rachel. Yeah, I'm just thinking cults down the ages have all tried to style themselves as being the chosen people which makes more sense of the Old Testament references. Hmm. We really haven't dug into the family of love. Uh, they have popped up every so often, and it is something, actually, that the background thereof would be really quite helpful, actually, for the, 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 yeah. these, these texts. Well, there is a whole play about them. So there is. So we might, we've, yeah. we've done the prologue to it, I think. Um, <laughs> that's about as far as we've got on the podcast. Uh, Rachel. Mm -hmm. uh, no, to what Lois, what Lois said about the... <laughs> Uh, I, I was wondering if the accent at the time, if um, bull and bowl sounded the same, uh, and if there was that play on words, you know, uh, how Lois just said that the, you know, the double entendre and the sexualization of this religion as some sort of, I don't know, free love religion or something, that if that, uh, even if they're literally talking about a bull in the scene, they have it there. If it sounds like bull, if it would have made the audience laugh, it, it, you know, at, at it as if it was some sort of cuckold joke, you know, mm. for the horns or something like that. Mm. Uh, Eric. Uh, yesterday, Alan had made the comparison of, um, I think it was uh, Mistress and uh, Master Molly Club to the I can't remember the character name. Sonadia, the, uh, the Sonadia couple. Yeah, them. Um, and I think you're beginning is beginning to come through, but not to the degree that they would deserve this. I don't know. Maybe it is, that, and just I don't know. Maybe I'm kind of like this guy is going way too far to extract revenge. I, actually, Eric, the analogy I was drawing was with Coppel de Moy and Mary Four, who we haven't seen today. Yeah, um, true. because yeah. we didn't see the Muller Grubbers as a couple yesterday. Yeah, true, but um, Mistress... uh, I think you could you could also apply it to yeah. this couple. <laughs> mm. yep. Yeah, so 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 the, the, there seem to be a lot of characters here of these associated with this sect of, of Protestants um, uh, with, with a Dutch connection. So uh, it's all sort of fitting within the uh, the, the Dutch side of things. But we need to move on because we have two scenes to do before we close the session. Uh, music has finished playing. Act four, scene one. Uh, enter Sir Hubert, uh, Sir Boys, uh, Lionel Freville, Crispinella, and servants with lights. More lights! Welcome, Sir Lionel Freville. Brother Freville, shortly. Look to your lights! The masks are at hand. 
pull down our daughter. Hark, they are at hand, rank handsomely. And enter the maskers uh, who dance. Uh, there is in the room uh, Be uh, Beatrice, uh, Beatrice Freeville, Malhuru, um, and uh, Malhuru is going to take uh, Beatrice from Freeville uh, at some point, and they're going to draw. So lots of business going on here with dancing and mock fighting. No, sir, I have the advantage of the place. You are not safe. I would deal even with you. So? They exchange so. gloves as pledges. So? I do beseech you, sweet. Do not for me provoke your fortune. What sudden flaw is risen? From whence comes this? An ulcer, long time lurking, now is burst. Good, sir, the time and your designs are soft. I, dear, dear sir, counsel him, advise him, twill relish well from your carving. Good, my sweet, rest safe. All's well, all's well, this shall be ended straight. The banquet stays, there we'll discourse more large. Marriage must not make men cowards. Nor rage fools. Tis valour not where heart peat, but reason rules. And exuant lots of people, except for uh, Tysifu and uh, Crispinella, who stay. But do you hear, lady, you proud ape, you? What was the jest you break of me even now? Nothing. I only said you were all metal, that you had a brazen face, a le leaden brain, and a copper beard. Quicksilver, thou little more than a dwarf and something less than a woman. A wisp, a wisp, a wisp. Will you go to the banquet? By the Lord, I think thou wilt marry shortly, too. Thou growest somewhat foolish already. Oh, if faith, this is a fair thing to be married and the necessary to hear this word must. If our husbands be proud, we must bear his contempt. If noisome, we must bear with the goat under his armholes. If a fool, we must bear his babble. And which is worse, if a loose liver, we must live upon unwholesome reversions. Where on the contrary side, our husbands, because they may and we must, care not for us. Things hoped with fear and God with strugglings are men's high pleasures when duty pulls and flats their appetite. <laughs> what a tart monkey is this, by heaven! If thou hadst not so much wit, I could find it in my heart to marry thee. Faith, bear with me for all this. Bear with thee? I wonder how thy mother could bear thee ten months in her, in her belly when I cannot endure thee two hours in mine eye. Alas for your sweet soul, by the Lord, you are grown a proud, scurvy, apish, idle, disdainful, scoffing God's foot, because you have read Euphuus and his England, Palmerin de Olivia, and the legend of lies. Why, faith, yet, servant, you of all others should bear with my known unmalicious humors. I've always in my heart given you your due respect, and heaven may be sworn I have probably privately given fair speech of you and protested. Nay, look you, for my own part, if I had not have not religiously vowed my heart to you, been drunk to your health, swallowed flat dragons, ate glasses, drunk urine, stabbed arms, and done all the offices of protested gallantry for your sake. And yet you tell me I have a brazen face and a little brain and a copper beard. Come yet, and it please you. No, no, you do not love me. Right. But I do now, and whosoever dares say that I do not love you may honor you. And if you would vouchsafe to marry. Nay, as for that, think on it as you will, but God's my record. And my sister knows that I've taken a drink and slept on it, that if I ever marry, it shall be you. And I will marry again, yet I hope not, do not say it, it shall be you neither. By heaven, I shall soon be as weary of health as of your enjoying. Will you cast a smooth cheek upon me? I cannot tell. I have no crumped shoulders. My back needs no mantle. And yet, our marriage is honorable. Do you think you shall prove a cuckold? <laughs> no, by the Lord, not I. Why, I th thank you, if faith. Hey-ho, I slept on my back this morning. 
and dreamt the strangest dreams. Good Lord, how things will come to pass. Will you go to the banquet? If you will be mine, you shall be your own. My purse, my body, my heart is yours. Only be silent in my house, modest at my table, and wanton in my bed. And the Empress of Europe cannot content and shall not be contented better. Can any kind heart speak more discreetly, affectionately? My father's consent, and it's for mine. Then thus and thus, so Hyman should begin. Sometimes a falling out proves a falling in. And uh, we'll just briefly pause there. Yeah, there's a there's a really interesting dynamic to this scene because it's sort of this insult fight between them of uh, escalation and, and back and forth and the question of how much of this is front how much of this is uh, is is their idea of foreplay I, I don't know um, opinions from the room on that there's some some really interesting uh, uh, Tyson has an interesting um, idea of uh, what you should do to prove your love um, I, I don't know at what point he drunk the urine um, uh, I I, 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 I I, I've not come across that as a courtship ritual, but hey, um, each to their own. Um, so yeah, there's 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 his, his expectations, uh, her responses, uh, following I say what's effectively a bit of music, bit of dance, a uh, bit of sort of uh, action where there isn't actually that much dialogue. Um, it's all plot and it's all performy, um, and then we say we get this little scene. Uh, Lois and Eric. Well, it's kind of interesting that one fake fight should be followed by another fake fight. Uh, mm. And uh, uh, I take it, though, that the thus and thus in that last line is two kisses, right? I mean, they, they kiss each other. Mm. Yeah. And, but there, there, there's a other question of, of um, this whole this re repetition of crumped shoulders. Is, is, uh, is that supposed to be an indication that uh, uh, Tyson Fu is supposed to be uh, have some sort of um, hunch or something? Yeah, she's very she tall, is. and he's and she, uh, um, uh, or she tries to make herself very tall, even though she isn't. I'm yeah. just wondering if there's a there's there's something going on because that's the second time she's referenced him that way, and I wonder I if that's thought, a thing. I always thought it had something to do with syphilis, actually. Just you know, because uh, it does something to the bones, doesn't it? You kind of start falling apart. But I mean, in that case, it would just be a rude joke. Uh, hmm. Um. Uh, Eric. Yeah, I was like. At some point, I was like, "Okay, this is trash talking each other," and then they kind of, like, but this few kind of becomes honestly like sort of not bored, but just kind of unable to keep up. He actually says, "You know, I'm, I'm I, if I had you know the wit to marry you, I would," kind of thing. Um, and but then Crispinella is flattered. I can't tell. I, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I was reading it, but yeah, it was kind of yeah. Yeah, and you know, it's it, 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 there's that interesting turning point towards the end where you know, will you go to the banquet? It's where she sort of offers him a crumb, and he's yeah, um, moment, you know, and, and it's like uh, you know, we've 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 danced this merry little dance, um, but yeah, uh, how, how that all fits together. Um, other thoughts before we do the final scene? Act? Um we have another little scene to do this session. No. Okay. So we return to our two favourite people in the room today. Uh, let's find out, um, uh, having done their little bit of uh, uh, street theatre uh, during the mask, uh, where we are in Act 4, Scene 2, Enter Freeville, speaking to some within and Malhuru at another door. As you respect my virtue, give me leave to satisfy my reason. Though not blood, so all runs right, our feigned rage hath ta'en to fullest life. They are much possessed of force most, most all quarrel. Now, my right friend, resolve me with open breast, free and true heart. Cannot thy virtue, having space to think and fortify her weakened powers with reason, discourses, meditations, discipline, divine ejaculatories, and all those aids against devils. Cannot all these curb thy low appetite and sensual fury? There is no God in blood, no reason in desire. Shall I but live? Shall I not be forced to act some deed whose very name is hideous? No. Then I must enjoy Francesquina. You shall. I'll lend this ring now it to that fair devil it will resolve me dead, which rumor with my artificial absence will make most firm. 
enjoy her suddenly. But if report goes strong that you are slain and that by me, whereon I may be seized, where shall I find your bee? At Master Chateau's, the jeweler's, to whose breast I'll trust our secret purpose. Aye, rest yourself. Each man hath follies. But those worst of all who, with a willing eye, do see f do seeing fall. Tis true, but truth seems folly, madness spectacles. I am not now myself, no man. Farewell. Farewell. When woman's in heart, in the soul, hell. Exit Malharu, leaving Freeville alone. Now, repentance, the fool's whip sees thee. Nay, if there's nay, if there be no means, I'll be thy friend, but not thy vices, and with greatest sense I'll force thee feel thy errors to the worst, the wildest of dangers thou shalt sink into. No jeweler shall see me. I will lurk where none shall know or think. Close I'll withdraw and leave thee with two friends, a whore and a knave. But is this virtue in me? No, not pure. Nothing extremely best with us indoors. No use in simple purities. The elements are mixed for use. Silver without a lay is all too eager to be wrought for use. Nor precise virtues ever purely good holds useful sighs with temper of weak blood, then let my course be borne, though with side wind, the end being good, the means are well assigned. And exit Creville, uh for that scene. Uh, thoughts from the room. Um, I'm, I'm seeing faces. I'm seeing lots of faces. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, who, want, who wants to convert those faces to words? Uh, Lynn. So he's decided to kind of double cross Malher, to at least temporarily get him in trouble for this murder that doesn't actually take place to teach him a lesson. I, what? <laughs> <laughs> I think broadly, I think you're there. You're there. Yeah. Like Freeville's in a position, like it's not like he has the high moral ground. <laughs> he was having a, a, an affair with Francesquina before. It's like, oh, you shouldn't sleep with her. That's naughty. I am going to teach you a lesson. But, but she was. I, I, I think it's the it's the hypocrisy he doesn't like. I I I think you know you were you were having all this moral stuff uh, earlier, and you know, you know I at least have been consistent in my 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 uh, <laughs> okay, my approach. Okay, that that makes sense because Mauer did kind of do the right thing. He came clean and said, you know, basically, your ex girlfriend is trying to bribe me into killing you. I don't know what to do. Um, so, I mean, that was kind of the right thing to do on Malheur's part. But I, I guess the angle that you shouldn't have pretended to be a Puritan in the first place, you know, that, make, that's, that's a, that makes it make a little more sense. Yeah, maybe. I <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that's an absolute, by the way. I'm just uh, the, throwing that out there. Uh, yeah, I mean, if Malheru didn't then follow up that he, uh, she wants you dead thing with, I still would quite like to sleep with her thing, then, then you know, it, it's that, that, that thing. He, his, 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 any moral position he may have stated at the beginning of the play has been totally compromised by this point. Um, <laughs> totally. You know, really yeah. does not have a single leg to stand on anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. Alan, I think, was next then. Rachel. Yeah, I... I, mean, I think we've debated this in previous plays that we've dealt with, looking for logic and consistency in early modern theatre is, I think, a bit of a, a fool's errand. <laughs> you know, it happens because the playwright thought it might be amusing to do it. Well, I think it's, it's it has a thematic logic, even if, it, even if structurally uh, it, it, it's being done just to sort of move things along. It, it, there is a sort of becauseness to it. I, th I think, however, if once in rehearsal with actors, you can make it all fit together. It's just you might have to do an awful lot of work to make, make that work. 
Uh, and of course, there is a question of what is Marston's thesis, which we'll know better tomorrow as to how this all fits together. Because, of course, we'll find out what happens to these people. And we've had this situation before where we get halfway through a Marston going, but they're all bastards. Um, <laughs> what do we do? And, yeah. and Marston usually leaves us in a in a in a in a position where we're sort of where 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 something has been done with that not always but um usually leaves us uh, them as compromised as us um uh rachel uh i mean it could be there, there could be other reasons to to this too like maybe he uh if he if he leaves town and isn't at the jewelers maybe uh there's a chance that he could throw um Freeville's ex-girlfriend under the bus too and he could get two executions for the price of one I mean he he did tell was, he was commissioned to murder him and be a hitman so he, he might just be trying to get him out of the way or it could be a les, li les liaisons dangereux where um uh, he, where he just doesn't want uh his friend sleeping with his ex-girlfriend and maybe on the surface he pretended to be cool but he's a he seemed to be a pretty possessive guy when talking about interest the other day oh lots of options there i'll go to helen then lois i have a strange feeling that he might appear as his, his own ghost to the girlfriend <laughs> something like that that would be interesting uh lois and then eric yeah um, yeah, I mean, it's still tricky to work out Freeville's motivation. I agree. I mean, I think maybe his point is that Malheureux, even when he realized how horrible Franceschina was, still wanted to sleep with her. I mean, I don't know, but because, uh, I mean, he can't really object to somebody who wants to do exactly what he was doing for, for I don't know how long. But, uh, uh, you know, he, I think he feels that somehow maybe Malheureux, Malheureux does appear to be the kind of person who's kind of obsessive about about things. I mean, he sort of obsessively virtuous and then obsessively, uh, well, obsessive about Franceschina and particularly about desiring her. Although the way they both talk is if, you know, once will be fine and after that he, he can just uh, drop her, uh, seems extraordinary too. You know, it's just a matter of having one good sexual encounter. But uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, clearly his point in that speech is that he's not doing everything totally for virtuous reasons, but then, oh, well, none of us is purely virtuous anyway. A bit of Montaigne again. And then, well, at least the end justifies the means, which seems to be what he's saying here. Yes, because that's not a, a, a dubious uh, a moral position to be uh, placed in. Uh, Eric. I was going to say that it's interesting because it, it reminds me of, um, like I mentioned this yesterday as well, there, there are some scenes that remind me of um, If You Know Not Me, part two, uh, which is like, because we, we had the sort of, I think it was Timothy the Puritan who got arrested at the, the or house or something or the brother or whatever you want to call it um and it was like okay um where what <laughs> but the hypocrisy of the characters didn't really sort of um line up with the rest of the plot it just kind of was there because we needed hobbs to to hobbs and to turn up and meet the queen um <laughs> yeah i don't know it just kind of i'm just curious where this is going to go to a degree Mm, yes, I mean, the, uh, and this session, of course, we've done the, you know, we're doing the Dutch courtesan. The Dutch courtesan has not featured in the in the entirety of the central section of this play. Uh, there was there was a, quite a lot last session, and the, there will be a return. Um, but it's 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 an interesting question in my mind as to structurally why that is. I mean, is there a doubling thing, or is there uh, is there something going on there, um, or is it just to give the actor a you know, a bit of a break. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that position, um, as well as yeah, yeah. Again, that, 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 the, the way this, uh, this, this flows as a text. I mean, uh, uh, of which uh, others in the room might be uh, better able to, uh, to discuss uh, and elucidate. Um, Alan, I think actually you, you may have hit the answer as to why she hasn't appeared because I do think it is doubling because we've, we've had. It a relatively female heavy session with this um, part of the play. There's been four or five active female characters, which is more than we often see in a whole play. Hmm. But that might not 
be a reason i say with the the nature of the company that that might not be a crunch mm. point that you would have in a playhouse company where the the number of uh, available actors for for females roles is is more circumscribed um but it might be it might be that that's literally what's going on there okay we're approaching final thoughts uh some of us have been here for the first session some of us haven't uh just a sense of shape and flow of the text um uh, what's landing, what's not landing, the questions and predictions. You know, what do we want the play to be doing by the end? Uh, what are we hoping for? What are we afraid of? What of our territory? Because Marston likes to bring up. Um, and um, Marston, very scatological today. Very, very, very fluidy, shall we say. Um, there's there's a lot going on here. The psychodrama going on in Marston's subtext here. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to send him to, 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 to a Freudian an analysis here at all because... <laughs> It wouldn't come out well. <laughs> He's got some issues. Um, lots of issues. Uh, so, yeah, final thoughts around the room. I'll, I'll go to um, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, any final thoughts? Just unmute myself there. Um, yeah, I feel like um, of, the, of the playwrights we've done, Marston is slowly growing on me. I feel like every time we do a Marston play, I'm not here. So maybe I haven't had as good a track record with his canon. But the play is sort of growing on me slowly. I feel like it's a bit of a slow burn. What I was thinking about for this text is the concept of morality. And we've got these moral, immoral and amoral characters, um, which Marston doesn't seem to pass judgment on. He doesn't tell us what to think of them. He just kind of says, here they are. Especially someone like, um, I can't remember the, his name, the one that was stealing everything. He keeps, he keeps coming back to steal more stuff. Um, there's, and Francesquina and the prostitutes. And it's a kind of sense of like, we don't get um, Marst, really Marston telling us whether they're good or bad. Even though we have that Montaigne essay sort of um, didactic dialogue that comes out sometimes, he doesn't tell us what to think. So I'm very, very interested in seeing how the play plays out. Mm. Yeah, lovely. Uh, Alan, any final thoughts? I'm going to reserve judgment in the main <laughs> until we've seen how the whole darn thing turns out because it's feeling more and more like two plays tried to put together and I haven't yet really seen much meaningful intersection between the two of them. Um, uh, it would just be interesting to see whether there is any significant overlap between the two in the final sequence. Uh, Helen, you weren't here for uh, the other day, so you're uh, shot in the dark, as it were. Uh, any final thoughts? Uh, yes, I'm... I think that quite a bit of it has to be down to the fact that the play is written for a boys' company. I think the scatological stuff is written because that's what the boys can play really well. Um, and I think that the, um, the young, short, but talented comic boy is is i mean i i certainly get a feeling that this is a play written for a company rather than a company fitted to a play mm. is what i'm trying to say yeah uh eric any final thoughts um yeah i'm, I'm i don't know i i've had two female characters over the past few two days and they, they were both very very heavy on the swearing which uh, obviously i i, I enjoy um, but <laughs> it, I don't know, it's just kind of interesting how they kind of, there are a lot of, um, like, we're not sure about the main characters, but we can be sure about the sideline characters, if that makes sense. So, uh, like, we know what Cockle de Moy is doing, we know what um, um, Chris Pinella is doing, Tissifu, all those, like, not main characters well are they i guess you could argue as an ensemble play in that sense uh, i'm curious to see what will happen and although i suspect we won't like the ending <laughs> or will we 
Who knows? Uh, Valentina, you also have, have, have stepped in um, to some, some interesting people, uh, as it were. Uh, any final thoughts? Uh, I think, like, I found it very frustrating. But I don't know if it is because I stepped in and I'm like, I'm not even here tomorrow. So, like, just like, to, just, it's, maybe it's just the middle session. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, it's just because, like, none of these characters seem to have any or not not none but most of these characters don't seem to have like redeeming characters <laughs> and you just go like what is going on also like i mean for the whole session i don't understand why coco de moy is it's it's picking on these people so much yes they're not great but um i don't know but mistress maligrub can be a lot of fun to play with I thought like her monologues were, were amazing. I wish I, yeah, I wasn't <laughs> reading it cold, but yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. I, I find it frustrating. Play. I don't. I don't even know if I'm like, I'm particularly regretful that I'm not going to be here tomorrow because I think I'll find it a frustrating ending as well. So. <laughs> 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 uh, Lois, any final thoughts? Yeah, I imagine that if the, if there is a moral point, it's going to come at the end, and we probably won't like it because it's difficult to see what a moral could be drawn from this that we would like. Um, yeah, I suspect that if one did the whole Cockle de Moy play on its own, which apparently has been done, I don't know, it might be funny, but it might just drive you crazy. I mean, I, I was feeling sorry for Molly Grubb because I was playing Molly Grubb, but I think almost anybody would feel sorry for him after seeing nothing but a whole sequence of things, however awful he and his wife may be. Uh, I mean, it's just such a constantly being hit over the head. It reminds me of these cartoon <laughs> characters that... Uh, are just constantly being, you know, flattened and uh, blown up and so on in uh, uh, in Disney cartoons. And uh, uh, you can either find it funny or you can start getting really depressed by it after a while. And as for exactly. the main plot, gosh, I don't know. I mean, uh, no, I think one has to see see the ending. Yeah. Um, yeah. The yeah that 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 element of yes um as I, I think i said this off camera that um you know this week uh another room is reading uh jack juggler which is an earlier tudor uh comedy which is is basically about one person picking on another person for not really a, a desperately good reason um <laughs> and on on one hand yeah it's good there's good comedy knockaboutness to it but also if you actually sort of unpick it a bit it's really disturbing <laughs> And you start going, well, is this turning into an early Brecht play, actually? Um, <laughs> you suck all the humour out of it, and it just becomes this sort of terrifying uh, battle of wits between two characters um, uh, for some strange moral purpose uh, that nobody's quite sure of anymore. Um, Lynn, any final thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I agree with everyone. Everything everyone has said. I, I, I'm nodding my head here. And I, I found that uh, the face that Valentina made, like, that said it all. <laughs> like, yeah, so few people in this are actually admirable or likable. It, it does leave a little bit of a bad taste in your mouth. Um, although I also completely agree with Elizabeth that the play and, and the author don't seem to be passing judgment on that. They're just sort of showing us. Uh, and as far as what I hope for, what I expect, you know, how is this going to shake out. I mean, obviously, poor Beatrice is going to believe that Freeville is actually dead because that rumor is going to start to to, to go about. And the, everything will probably more or less sort out in the end. But I really hope that Beatrice uh, rejects Freeville in the end when she finds out that, that what a, a manipulator and, and rake he's been she's going to be like, you know, we're not going to be a good fit. Uh, I mean, she's not a very interesting character. She's a little boring, but she's decent. And Freeville kind of isn't. And you know, that's my hope is that all this playing around that Freeville does in the end kind of ends up biting him in the ass because his, his respectable girlfriend from a good family says, on second thought, no. Uh, excellent. Uh, Rachel, any final thoughts? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I brought up yesterday, like, there's a lot of Jekyll and Hyde with Freeville's character. I think he's a, he's not a 
nice character, but he's very interesting because like, it's not that Marston is passing judgment on him, but he's almost evil the way that uh, he, he turns on people and that he's, he plays, you know, he's playing both women uh, in his life almost. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know where I stand yet on this. It, it's just like Marston just gives you these people and they're not nice people, but you see that there's some, there's some realism in this for the time. And even in modern times, there are people who, you know, they cheat on people and they continue on with their lives. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, you were talking about, you know, wh whether we like these people or not, you know, this is this is in that mold of comedy where, you know, you're demonstrating these 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 uh, these these potential or potentially that's what's going on. The, these uh, these people you're not supposed to emulate, but you are supposed to laugh at. Um, and uh, and and even in his own time, Marston was frequently referred to as being all bitterness and piss and stuff. You know, he's you know, it, it, it's his shtick, um, this and uh yeah, uh, I, I, and of course, it's all, all all a matter of taste. You do, you don't have to like this kind of thing. It's just a question of whether uh, uh, somebody else will, uh, and it's acceptable, uh, and, and it works, and it's just not just horrificness for the sake of things being a horrific. Uh, Eric. Yeah, but I, I like sort of. I do like how the prologue was basically a disclaimer going, oh, no, there isn't anything objectionable in this play. It's perfectly clean. It's not, yeah, nothing at all. It could possibly, yeah. It's just, um, <laughs> it, 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 if you read the prologue and then you read the play, um, it disproves the prologue. Mm, yeah, we strive not to instruct but to delight. Yes. Uh, Lois. Yeah, I suppose it's true that it's not objectionable in the sense that there's no sort of political or social satire. I mean, it's all uh, the, the targets are very soft targets. But uh, uh, on the other hand, for an audience, seeing boys dressed as women coming out with the sort of stuff Chris Pinella particularly is coming out with and some of Franceschina, I mean, I think there's a deliberate uh, shock effect, really. I mean, uh, you know, Beatrice is shocked by the way Chris Pinella is talking, but... Uh, I mean, an audience is not really used to hearing that either. I mean, there's there's not very much of that kind of language in any of the plays we've read. Mm, yeah, except by Marston. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> funnily. He, he really is, uh, is is playing that 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 card for all it's worth, isn't he? Mm. Yeah. Um... Well, I think in the in one of the Parnassus plays, doesn't someone refer to him as Monsieur Kinsader lifting up your leg and pissing on the world or something like that? Yeah, yeah pretty much. Pretty <laughs> yeah. much. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah, Marston's got a rep, um, uh, and we're going to find out how how he concludes uh, next time. Uh, so, uh, unless anyone has any bursting thoughts they want to uh, to, I'm going to go down a very terrible tra tangent there with that sentence. Anyone uh, wants wants to say, um, uh, speak now, forever hold your peace. Otherwise, I will close the session. Thanks to all the wonderful readers for all their wonderful reading, for all their wonderful thoughts. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Bye. Soft skins save us.